Hello everyone, welcome to part 2 on our look at fat oxidation and as well as storage. So just a summary from last class, we talked about high sensitivity lipase and MAG lipase, which are the two enzymes used to mobilize triglycerides. High sensitivity lipase is sensitive to epinephrine, the hormone, and glucagon. There are two fates of glycerol, which include becoming triacylglycerols or entering glycolysis or gl through gluconeogenesis. There are three steps for fatty acids, three-step process for fatty acids to be used as a fuel source. So first, we need the activation of fatty acids to fatty acid CoA. They transport a fatty acid CoA to the matrix via carnitine antiport. Anti then we have a four-step beta oxidation with the conversion of fatty acid CoA to acetyl CoA. And again, the yield from one palmitic acid, which was 16, zero, so 16 carbon, can yield as high as 106 ATP. So again, here's a, essentially a figure to re give you a reminder about the carnitine transporter. So we have our fatty acyl CoA and our regulatory mantle CoA binding site, which again involves our coenzyme A. Here we have our anti-transport, anti-port, sorry, with the translocase enzyme, which is the anti-porter enzyme. Here we use carnitine translocase one, carnitine translocase two, and again, Fatty acyl CoA is broken down, but then remade here and then turned into acetyl CoA. Then this enters beta oxidation. So, some sources of triglycerides include our adipose tissue, which contain up to 50,000 to 100,000 kilocalories. So, we can hear, we can see in the blood, we talked about how it can be carried with albumin. Uh, free fatty acids can be carried with albumin. Then glycerol can also enter the blood. We actually also have intramuscular stores of triglycerides, which are usually can come from. We have glycogen as well. We can have, we can see here we have very limited in, in comparison to this. So this intramuscular triglyceride can actually be burned quite easily, especially if those are highly active. There be, you'll see pictures of you likely. There's one picture that went around a lot that was two quadriceps muscles through a cross sectional. That looks slightly inappropriate. <laughs> Anyways, there's muscles. So here's the leg. So this is like a looking down into the muscles. So we'd have our quadriceps, etc., hamstrings. So essentially, this person was a marathon runner. And this person was very sedentary. And essentially, you could see in the sedentary person, they had a lot of intramuscular fat dep deposits in their muscles. And those can be kind of those things found on imaging can be a sign of like unhealthy lifestyle where this one's this person's muscle stayed completely lean and void of fat so you can see that it can be a good thing and because we need fat storage and for survival potentially but we can see that in active muscles the intramuscular stores can actually be quite reduced but again these can be used quickly the intramuscular storage is much used before we kind of go to here where we can form acetyl-CoA, and then this enters the Krebs cycle for energy, for exercise. And well, you've probably heard about how if you do long-term exercise, you start to burn fat, more fat. So again, when we use that glycogen, and we also have those ATP, creatine phosphate, those are used first. But when we start to go for that longer-term exercise, we start to use more fat in our exercise. And that's you guys have probably heard about, like, fasting cardio. So I guess one of the main theories of fasting cardio is that you're burning fat first because you you don't have that storage of glycogen in your muscle or glucose in your body because you're fasted from overnight when you sleep you most people do it in the morning they wake up and do fasting cardio so that's kind of the theory on that so as we said we have intramuscular triglycerides or imtgs so again this is kind of the breakdown of our constituents so we have our muscle triglyceride, muscle glycogen, plasma free fatty acids, plasma glucose. And this is at a percent of maximal oxygen consumption. So like our VO2 max, how hard we're working. So as we see, we go up on the intensity. We can see energy expended goes up. We use our platy fatty acids, but we also use a lot of muscle glycogen. So that's, again, our main primary source. That's why we talk about carbohydrates being the main source of energy. So 
So again, this is before training. So this is the percent of total energy where the energy comes from. So in an untrained person, we can see most of the energy is coming from carbohydrates and much less from intramuscular triglycerides and plasma-free fatty acids. But in comparison, in a more active individual after training, they actually end up using triglycerides more than anything else. So another example is ketone bodies, which is an alternative fate of acetyl-CoA. So ketone bodies are produced when there's excess acetyl-CoA during fat oxidation, which mainly, mainly in the mitochondrial matrix of the liver cells. When glucose is scarce, that when glucose is scarce, that sorry, energy must be obtained from breaking down fatty acids. So ketone bodies are an acetoacetate, which is a 3-hydroxybutyrate and acetone. So these get transported in the blood to the peripheral tissues where they can be reconverted into acetyl-CoA and oxidized by the citric acid cycle. The liver constantly produces low levels of ketone bodies, but production becomes an important, more significant during starvation when, they're ne- when they are needed to provide energy. So essentially, like as we in starvation, our body will start to burn all our fat stores. But ketone bodies also be used once that we go through those fats. So here we can see our pathway. You know, we got our glucose going through glycolysis, etc. But we can also have our glycerol enter, becoming G3P, becoming pyruvate. Fats can also become fatty acids and become acetyl-CoA through all the things we talked about with acetyl-CoA. Fatty acetyl-carnitine. Again, these all enter here into the citric acid cycle. We can also have amino acids enter the citric acid cycle from muscle tissue, but this is bad. This is when we're at a quite high starvation rate, and we're actually taking like proteins, because as we talked about, many of the most important things in our body are proteins, so we start to break down our own tissues. So, a person whose starvation diet will not have oxaloacetate available for the conversion of c- to acetyl-CoA to citric acid cycle. So essentially, in starvation, we get rid of, we don't have this or this, or this. So we can't produce this or this. So we don't have enough. We need oxaloacetate. Without oxaloacetate, we need this gets stimulated. So we'll see. So ketone bodies as fuel. So ketone bodies are important source of fuel because they're soluble in aqueous solution and do not need to be incorporated into lipoproteins or carried by albumin like other lipids. They can be transported across the mitochondrial membrane, so without all the carnitine antiporters and stuff like that, as well as across the blood-brain barrier into the cell membranes. So in emergency situations, ketone bodies can actually give energy to the brain, which is super important, which is mainly used as glucose in normal situations. So ketone bodies are the major energy source, approximately 75% for the brain during starvation when insufficient glucose is available. They are produced in appreciable amounts, ketone bodies are produced in appreciable amounts only during periods of excess acetyl-CoA production. They are used in extrahepatic tissues like the brain, heart, and muscle, in direct proportion to their concentration in the blood. So, excessive ketones, starvation, and diabetes. When the rate of ketone body production is higher than the rate of use, blood and urine levels rise of ketones. So this can be detected in the blood and urine. This is seen in cases of starvation and severe diabetes. This can be associated with coma and death, and acetone production in diabetes produces characteristic fruity smell in the breath. So again, instead of this, we go in it and we can form our ketone bodies. So fat synthesis. So fat synthesis is an anabolic process and shows how eating food other than fat can make us fat. So this is why if we still eat a lot of carbs, there's still fat is still synthesized. So we want a lot of times when we have excess stuff, it will get turned into the fat. So it's not we don't have to eat fat to get fat. Or to Yeah. So glucose can be converted into fatty acids via acetyl CoA, which is what which is what we're going to look at closely later in this lecture. So this occurs primarily in the liver and the lactating mammary glands and to a small extent in adipose tissue and kidney. So glucose 
can essentially come all the way through and end up being where we have acetyl-CoA turned into fatty acids. But again, this can be rebroken down and put in back into acetyl-CoA when we actually need the energy. So this essentially when we have excess carbohydrates, so this is why a lot of people harsh on, uh, and understandably so in a lot of scenarios, is like people go on low-carb diets. Because a lot of time we're eating way more carbs than we should because it's, I guess, a lot of the current foods and that we eat and then it's unhealthy foods have a high carb content. So again, these high carbohydrates or excess carbohydrates after glycogen stores are filled, which aren't really that big, start to turn into acetyl-CoA, but then turn to fatty acids and then are stored into adipose tissue. And again, they get stored there and then we never really get to the point where we have to use fatty acids again because we keep having that high carbohydrate intake. So we keep using glucose as our energy source, but we never actually get to our fatty source to break it down, to actually lose the fat. So that's kind of why we keep getting fat cells, even though we can break them down. We actually need to get an energy, a negative kind of energy balance. So less calories than, you, than you're intaking to actually work towards burning the fatty acids. So the synthesis of fatty acids from acetyl-CoA is from acetyl-CoA. There's a lengthening of carbon chain by two carbons at a time, but it's not simply a reverse. So although this sounds familiar to fatty acid oxidation, or beta oxidation is not this it's not completely the same, but they share some common properties. So fatty acid synthesis involves two steps. Step one is the synthesis of mannanol CoA. And this occurs through the carboxylation of acetyl CoA to mannol CoA via acetyl CoA carboxylase. This is our enzyme. Step two is the elongation of fatty acid chain. So we have the elongation of the fatty acid chain via fatty acid synthase to a 16 carbon palmitate or palmitic acid. Further elongation will be accomplished by the elongase enzyme. Whoops. So step one, we have the synthesis of mannanol CoA. So mannanol CoA is formed when the molecule of acetyl CoA is joined with a molecule of CO2, requiring energy rendered from ATP. So carboxylation of acetyl-CoA is through the biotin and coenzyme. So mannol coa is the donor of carbons of atoms of carbon atoms in fatty acid synthesis. So you have acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, we have a CO2 go in, and again we require the energy, so we have an ATP and inorganic phosphate to produce, then we have our mannol coa as our product. So step two was our fatty acid synthase enzyme. So we have our two monomers, one and two. And we have our terminal group, our SH groups, and seven enzymes. So here we have all our enzymes, one, two, three, four. Oh, and the other enzymes, so we can see the kind of repeat as we go through. So again... So here's our seven enzymes, one, two, three, four down here, and then this is just a repeat of the same enzyme. Sorry about that. So it's important to note that NADPH and not NADH are involved in fatty acid synthesis. So here should we go NADPH. Getting NADP, and again, same down here. So there are three, these are the three Final reactions of fatty acid synthase enzyme. So again, NAD plus has oxidative power for energy production, while NADPH has reductive power for energy storage. So again, here's our identification signal. So main again, NAD plus for energy production with oxidative power, and NADPH is reductive power for energy storage. So the end product of fatty acid synthesis is palmitic acid, or palmitate, which is 16 carbon. So palmitic acid is a saturated fatty acid with 16 carbons and no double bonds. It's one of the most important fatty acids in biology. So this second number indicates where the double bonds we. So some will have just random. So this would be carbon four, this four. So this indicates where the carbon bond is, the double bond is. But we'll get to that later. So again, 
This is a saturated fatty acid. But unsaturated fatty acids are also important biologically. And so what if we need to make those? So this is a little texty, but just read it out. So a little bit of palmitic acid. So again, palmitic acid is the most common saturated fatty acid found in the human body and can provide it can be provided in the diet or synthesized endogenously from other fatty acids, carbohydrates, and amino acids, like we talked about. Fatty acids rep palmitic acid represents twenty to thirty percent of the total fatty acids in the membrane phospholipids. So remember we talked about a phospholipid bilayer. So this acid is very important in forming those. It's also huge in adipose triglycerols, triacylglycerols. On average, a 70 kilogram mam is made up of 3.5 kilograms of palmitic acid. As the name suggests, palmitic acid is the major component of palm oil, 44% of total fats, but significant amounts of palmitic acids can also be found in meat and dietary dairy products, as well as cocoa butter and olive oil. Furthermore, palmitic acid is present in breast milk with 20 to 30% of total fats. So, the disruption of palmitic acid homeostatic balance implicated in different physiopathological conditions such as atherosclerosis, neurodegenerative diseases, and cancer is often related to uncontrolled palmitic acid endogenous biosynthesis irrespective of its static contribution. So we end up producing a lot more in our body than we should. So again, as we talked about, first we make palmitic acid. Second, we elongate it with elongase enzyme. So this elongate, enz elongase enzyme elongates by two carbons at a time. Then we desaturate it with the desaturase, saturase enzyme. So this desaturase enzymes cannot introduce double bonds at all positions, making some unsaturated fatty acids essential. So there's certain carbons, like carbon two and carbon three, that we cannot insert. That desaturase cannot insert double bonds, and this includes linoleic acid and linoleic acid. So we'll talk about omega six and three. And these are these two. So here we have omega-3 and omega-6. But we'll talk about that soon. So unsaturated fatty acids. So again, we go from acetyl-CoA to palmitic acid, which is 16 carbon. We can have desaturase create palmitic acid with elongase. Adding double bonds. Same thing here. We can have elongase becoming 18 carbon. We can perform steric acid. Or we can form oleic acid, for example. But we cannot form on two and three. So we have linoleic acid and linoleic acid that are essential. Just like our proteins, we have to get it from our diet. And these are our essential fatty acids. So remember, fats can be synthesized from non-fat substances like acetyl-CoA. Fat synthesis involves two main steps until the final product, palmitic acid, is formed. This is through the mantle donor of carbon atoms in step one and the elongation until we get 16 carbons in fatty acid, 16 carbon fatty acid in step two. Palmitic acid can be combined with other fatty acids elongated by two carbons at a time or desaturated to become unsaturated fatty acids, adding those double bonds. There are two essential unsaturated fatty acids due to the limitation of to the desaturatase enzymes. This is our A linoleic acid and linoleic acid. We also have DHA and EPA, which are the most important parts of omega 3. We'll talk about that right now. So, source of omega fatty acids in food. So, again, we're talking about we need these are essentials. So, omega 3s in cold water, high fat fish, especially Alaskan salmon, sardines, anchovies, mackerel, shad, herring, and trout. It's also in flaxseed oil, which has the highest linoleic content of any food. And it's vegan, technically. We also have flax seeds, flaxseed meal, hemp seed oil, hemp seeds, walnuts, pumpkin, Brazil nuts, and sesame seeds. Also avocados, which you've likely heard. And certain dark green leafy vegetables, including kale, spinach, purslane, mustard greens, and collards. So omega-6 is found in flaxseed oil as well. Flax seeds and flaxseed meal. Hemp seed oil, hemp seeds, grape seed oil. Such as, and we also have seeds such as pumpkin seeds and raw sunflower seeds. We also have nuts, including pingola, which is pine nuts, and pistachios, barrage oil, even promise oil, evening promise oil, blackcurrant seed oil, and size. So, again, some of the things to consider because these are pretty good health. These are important for your health. So, again, there's a lot of 
you know, you'll see your omega-3 supplements and omega-6 supplements. Or even see your 369 sometimes. But a lot of people would say, well, kind of lean toward you need the omega-3. But again, these are both quite important. And they have quite a bit of effects. There's a lot of studies of how they affect your HDL and LDL. So there's a lot of things they can lower your cholesterol. But sometimes they can also, from what I've heard and read in the literature, is that they can lower both. So you have to kind of know where you're at. So if you're willing, sometimes it will definitely lower, it can lower your LDL, but it can sometimes also lower HDL as well. So the benefits of essential fatty acids. So linoleic acid can become DPA and linolenic acid can become EPA, then DHA. So again, as I said, they can exert cholesterol and inflammation lowering benefits, decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, increase resting metabolic rate, and contribute to healthy cell membranes and brain function. So they have a lot of effects. So I've seen a lot of professionals really recommend that. This is probably one of those actual one supplements where they actually recommend you to actually take it. Compared to like something like oh, vitamin C, where you kind of end up just urinating it out anyways. Like it doesn't really have that benefit. But omega-3s have a lot of research proving their cholesterol and inflammatory effects. So a lot of people on rheumatoid arthritis and other certain inflammatory conditions or take relatively high doses of these as daily supplements to keep their inflammation under control. And then they have a lot of shown benefits of decreasing CVD and again, increasing metal resting metabolic would increase caloric output and they contribute to healthy cell membranes as we talked about with becoming palmitic acid and other stuff like that and keeping our phospholipid bilayers healthy. This can prevent certain issues with our cells. And they can also help with brain function. So these are our polyunsaturated fatty acid biosynthesis. So here's our N6 series and our N3. So we have our linoleic acid. We see it's 18,3. Becomes 20 to 3. So change in 6 to saturase. Then we have an elongase where we elongate it to 20 to 3. Then we have another desaturase where it becomes a racrodinic acid. Then another elongation to 20 to 4. Then again, turn to 25 into our DPA, which is di acid. And then we also have our DHA. And again, we can see it's the same enzymes here, just different products. And then we end with a 22,6 at DHA. So summary of fat synthesis. So ketones are produced when there's excess acetyl-CoA in the body and is converted to acetyl-CoA in hepatic tissues for the citric acid cycle. Fatty acid synthesis is an anabolic process and all excess macronutrients, including glucose, carbs, stuff like that, is converted to fatty acids. So that's why too much of any type of food will increase your fat. Fatty acid synthesis is a two-step process where one, there's a conversion of mannol coa and then two, the, the elongation of fatty acid chains by the fatty acid synthase enzyme to the end product of our 16-carbon palmitic acid then this palmitic acid will possibly be elongated and dehydrogenated to form other fats. Then there's an important difference is in the saturated fatty acids and unsaturated fatty acids. Then we have an essential unsaturated fatty acids, which are linoleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. Our unsaturated fatty acid synthesis, we go from our 18,2 N6 and then 18,3 N3, which have the conversions into our polyunsaturated acids with our DPA. And DHA. Sorry, DHA. So just to overview, now we're going to move and just touch on gluconeogenesis. So essentially, this is getting glucose, new glucose creation from other things. So as we saw, we saw fats can go into glycolysis, taking the place of glucose. This is essentially many, fat is not the only thing that can do that. So essentially, it's a synthesis of glucose from non-glucose precursors. So this does not include the synthesis of glucose from glycogen. So we'll be talking about glycogenolysis, where glycogen can enter the glycolysis. That is not considered gluconeogenesis, because that's just a storage form of glucose. So the location of gluconeogenesis. So essentially, it occurs in the cytoplasm. Again, this is just a cross-section of the cell to show you, give you orientation of where the mitochondria are and such like that. So, isn't glycogen just enough? So, as we said, glycogen can enter. So, we can have glycogenolysis, 
or a glycan chain, which is a bunch of our glucose units together. With phosphate, we have a glycogen phosphorylase, which gets yield to glucose 1-phosphate in a glycogen chain. So this big glycogen chain is slowly having pieces broken off, essentially. Then we have a phosphoglucomutase, getting our glucose 6-phosphate, which, as we know, we've seen before. Then we use water through glucose 6-phosphate, phosphatase, forming, breaking down that glycogen, and then this glucose and phosphate, enter, the glucose enters the blood. Then we use it. So, fat isn't enough either. So, so if we want glucose, since acetyl-CoA cannot be converted to glucose, some tissues, including the brain, need glucose for energy, so fat stores aren't capable of meeting this need. So, when we form acetyl-CoA, it can become fatty acids. We can have synthesis of fatty acids, and this can be broken down back into acetyl-CoA. But the acetyl-CoA, can, which can go into citric acid cycle, so just for energy, but, for example, running on fats alone, so if we had no other fuel but fats, we wouldn't have glucose for the brain. And again, the brain needs glucose. So, acetyl-CoA can't go back to glucose, so we need another way to have gluconeogenesis. So remember, glycolysis is, involves many irreversible reactions. So whenever the overall chemical process of a metabolic pathway has to be reversed, the reverse pathway is not exactly the same as the forward pathway. So gluconeogenesis pathway. So again, we're going this way this time. So gluconeogenesis essentially starts with pyruvate. So you need two pyruvates to get one glucose, just like one glucose yields one, glu one glucose yields two pyruvates. So gluconeogenesis is an 11-step process. Each step uses a different enzyme and has a different reactant product. The product of one step becomes the reactant of the next, and the formation of glucose is the metabolic process. And the path of glucose formation is a metabolic pathway. So again, you can see it's quite similar to glycolysis in reverse, but there's several key highlighted here and things that are different and unique. So here we can see pyruvate back to oxaloacetate. We actually have a bicarbonate. We use ATP. We're using a GTP. We use water. Again, we use quite a bit of energy to have this occur, but we need this to occur for our brain. So example, protein can also become glucose. So amino acids from diets, which can either which normally go into proteins, become proteins or other tissue components. So amino acids in excess of, of immediate requirements will either be have their NHs removed and then turned into urine and released in the urine, or this carbon hydrogen skeletons can be taken to create lipids and li, lipids or lipid derivatives, turn into water or CO two, or it can become glucose. So, but this doesn't go directly to glucose. We usually get pyruvate from muscle protein first. And then we go through our gluconeogenesis pathway. So the breakdown of muscle proteins gives rise to different amino acids, some of which can enter the citric acid cycle following conversion to oxaloacetate. So oxaloacetate is then converted into pyruvate, which is converted into amino acid alanine. So remember we saw a pyruvate crossroads. One of the things it go to was alanine. So again, muscle, muscle's broken down, turned into 20 amino acids. So some of the amino acids enter the citric acid cycle, forming oxaloacetate. These oxaloacetates then become pyruvate. And then this is inhibited by starvation. So if this occurs, it goes into... It doesn't go into acetyl-CoA, because we don't have the stores. We don't have the food or the fat or anything. So then it becomes alanine. Then alanine will become pyruvate, and then this will become glucose. And usually it's prioritized to go to the brain. So why convert oxaloacetate to alanine? So oxaloacetate is converted to alanine because pyruvate isn't carried in the blood. And the muscle is breaking down the protein to provide glucose to other tissues. Alanine is carried into the blood to other tissues where it then converted back to pyruvate and onto glucose. So in this scenario, we're not just needing energy. We need, although we do need energy, but we need glucose first. That's a more priority, not as... 
This energy is to keep stuff functional, but we don't need that overall high ATP compared to instead of having pervade go into the citronized cycle, that is prioritized. We can also have pervade from lactate as we discussed earlier about the Cori cycle. So the Cori cycle is a cycling of lactate produced by red blood cells and muscles, so like during exercise, turned back into glucose. So in the liver, we can have glycogen become glucose. We can also have lactate. So lactate in blood or lactate produced from the muscle usually ends up released into the blood. Then this goes into the kidney and this lactate through gluconeogenesis turned to glucose, which can either be stored or released as glucose in the blood for energy. Again, if there's excess glucose in the blood, it can be turned into the muscle glycogen. So when we exercise, we break down that muscle glycogen through anaerobic glycolysis, and then we have further lactate, and then we repeat the cycle. So again, that's why it's called a Cori cycle. So we can also get glucose from glycerol. So glycerol is formed from triglyceride breakdown, as we discussed. So here we can see we go from glycerol to glycerol through phosphate, through glycerol kinase. We see the kinase functioning. Then we go through G3P, back to our DHAP, through glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase. Then we have kind of a double reaction here where we have adelase and triose phosphate isomerase forming glycerol aldehyde 3 phosphate. So that's our G3P now. This becomes glucose 6 phosphate. So again, this is kind of going backwards through glycolysis, but in a different kind of way. And then we get our glucose. So again, this is kind of the whole pathway here. Pyruvate to oxal acetate to phosphophenyl pyruvate to 3 phosphoglycerate, 1,3 biphosphate, glycerate, fructose 1,6 phosphate, fructose 6 phosphate, glycerol phosphate, glucose. So again, even though the reactions are similar, they involve a lot of different enzymes and different things, and it's not just the exact reverse. And there's many irreversible reactions. Even here, we can see quite some irreversible reactions. So glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis. So during glycolysis, the net production generates 2 ATP. While gluconeogenesis is a net production that costs 4 ATP and 2 GTP. So it actually requires energy. So again, gluconeogenesis is very costly from an energy standpoint, but it must happen since tissues require continuous source of glucose. So again, it's the body prioritizes this, the need for glucose, over our energy requirements, our energy balance. So in this state, you would likely, your body would kind of give you signals to not move. You would feel quite tired. You know, your body's trying to signal to you don't waste energy. So you're, essentially most of these gluconeogenesis occur during fasted states or even starvation. So summary of gluconeogenesis, some tissues need a constant supply of glucose, like the brain. So we had our brain. And your body will do whatever it takes to get that glucose to your brain. Essentially, gluconeogenesis is a method to ensure tissues like the brain and red blood cells receive a constant supply of glucose from non-glucose substrates, like amino acids, glycerol, and lactate. It is not merely a reverse of glycolysis due to the irreversible reactions. And is an energy-consuming pathway, but is not a pathway that is required. So if we have a proper enough dietary intake and enough energy intake, it doesn't need to happen. So just we're going to talk about a few specific structures for the last couple slides. And that will be the end of our biochemistry. So again, summary of erythrocyte or red blood cells. Sorry. So our red blood cells use glucose only, just like for energy. They do not use glycogen or no fat. They do not have mitochondria, so they can't have citric acid cycle electron transfer chain occurring. So there's no oxidative phosphorylation. So red blood cells are strictly anaerobic. Funny enough, even though they carry oxygen, they don't actually use it, use it themselves. ATP is generated from the conversion of glucose to lactate, and this lactate is released into the plasma through the course cycle. And that's how they get their energy. So another example is the brain. Glucose is essential for brain function. It cannot use glu the, the brain does not have glucose or glycogen stores. Glucose is entry through passive diffusion, but the brain can actually use ketone bodies which is a partial compensation. So ketone bodies can provide approximately one half of the energy needs of the brain. So in the starvation state, when you're actually using these ketone bodies, it's not keeping it at optimal function, but it can keep your brain essentially functioning. So another example is the skeletal muscle energy metabolism. 
So muscles, as you guys you know, like as you exercise, consume lots of energy. They're quite large organs. They're the least discriminant. They use glucose or fat. They use pretty much everything. They use some. They have some glycogen stores, which are intramuscular, and they also have intramuscular triglycerides, as we discussed. But there's no glucose release in the muscles. Muscles have violent exercise adaptation, meaning that they're very responsive to like their muscles have highly metabolic malleable metabolic systems in the sense that compared to like other systems like the heart the me- metabolic process in the heart and the muscles can change so as we saw in that one figure with the changing of the intramuscular triglyceride storage increasing as we became fitter so this gives us more energy storage in their muscles so we also see that glucose to lactate and to regenerate NAD plus occurs as we release lactate from our muscles So another example is liver energy metabolism, which is essentially done to maintain blood glucose. This mainly occurs in a postprandial state after eating, where we synthesize glycogen through glycogenesis. So this is after we ate, we have an elevated blood glucose. We're not using the energy, so we store it. In a fasting state, we degrade glycogen through glycogenolysis to release glucose into the blood. In a starvation state, we can synthesize glucose through gluconeogenesis from amino acids and glycerol, so from our fat stores and our muscles and other tissues. We can also take our fatty acids to create ketones, which can also be used in the brain. So that's the end of our fat lectures and as well as the end of the biochemistry lectures. There was quite a bit of overlap with the biology lectures, so I recommend you watch these, watch biology first and then come to this lectures. So next, we'll likely be moving to anatomy and physiology, but I'm not sure yet. Uh, let me know if you, if there's any topic you guys want specifically. But anyway, see you next time.